Welcome to a colloquium jointly sponsored by Computer Science and Engineering and the UW East Science Institute. Uh, today we've got Emily Fox speaking to us. Emily is one of a cluster of great hires by the University of Washington in computer science and engineering and statistics and elsewhere in big data topics this year. So these folks will be arriving over the course of the next year and uh, Emily is one of the first wave that we're happy to have join us. Uh, she has her bachelor's, master's, and PhD in EECS from MIT. Then, I hope I get this right, she spent uh, a year in Duke Statistics on a postdoc, uh, then was a faculty member in the uh, stats department of the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania for a while, and then joined the University of Washington this fall as the Amazon professor of machine learning in the statistics department. So uh, we're real happy to have her here today. So without uh, further ado, Emily Fox, thanks for being here. Thanks, Ed. Okay, um, so in this talk, I'm going to present a set of Bayesian dynamic models that represent a body of work that I've been developing over the last few years, um, and it results from collaborations with the people shown here. So in particular, our interest is in developing flexible time series models, and in particular, when we're looking at limited data, at least with respect to the complexity of our dynamics or the dimensionality of the time series, it's very important to think of ways of sharing information both across time and across space. So I think the first thing that's important to hammer home is the fact that time series data are everywhere. So this picture might correspond to some set of features extracted from conference audio recordings, or maybe there are a set of daily returns from some set of stock indices, or perhaps they're taken from recordings on, uh, from sensors on some motion capture suit as a person's going through some set of exercise routines. And other applications include maybe MEG data where a person sits in this chair, wears this helmet with all these spatially distributed sensors that provide recordings of brain activity over time. Um, or we might be looking at flu estimates in different regions in the US. Well, these represent just a few of the applications we're gonna touch upon in this talk. And the set of time series data we're faced with, the list just goes on and on and on, right? We live in time, so naturally data are collected in time, and harnessing that temporal structure is really key to making a lot of inferences. So just to formalize this a bit, we're gonna represent our observation vector at time t by yt, so maybe every element of this corresponds to a different stock we're looking at. And maybe the task we're interested in is looking at prediction. So guessing the value of the observation at time t based on the history of what we've observed so far. Okay, so to think about this, let's look at a very toy example. And here, an oracle is gonna provide us with some sequence of green and blue tokens. And then we're asked to predict the color of the next token we receive. Well, if we ignore the temporal structure and just assume independent observations, in the absence of any other knowledge about the game, we're just gonna count the occurrences of green and blue tokens. In this case, we got seven greens, eight blues, and so our best guess is that this um, next token we have, 46.7% chance of it being green, so if we had to make a guess, we'd guess blue. Okay, well, it turns out that what the oracle was doing was if the oracle just gave us a green token, then there was 0.9 probability of giving us another green token. But if we just got a blue token, it's 0.1 probability of getting a, a green token. So even if this oracle gave us an infinite sequence of these tokens, if we ignore the temporal structure, that means we don't care about, or we're not looking at the order in which we're getting these observations, and we're just counting blues and greens, we're gonna end up with 50-50 of each. And so we're just gonna be arbitrarily guessing between the two. However, if we actually use a dynamic model, we can get prediction accuracies of up to 90%. So clearly, harnessing temporal structure is useful in many applications because not only do we get information about each observation at every point in time, we also have information between observations, how one observation evolves to the next. Okay, so we'd like to use these types of dynamic models, um, but often there are a few challenges we're faced with when we look at these types of models. One is the fact that we can have complex, uncertain dynamics. So just as a little illustration, I just mean that typically we're in the situation where the parameters associated with our dynamics are unknown, and also the dynamic mechanism itself might be much more complicated than the toy example that I gave before. Maybe there are corruptions or other types of complexities in how the observations are evolving in time. So we're gonna start by addressing this issue, 
And then later in the talk, we're gonna look at when we have collections of related time series or a high dimensional time series um, with changing correlations between the elements. Okay, so let's start with this idea of complex <coughs> uncertain dynamics. And to motivate this, let's look at some honeybee data. So, yes, there were movies, I didn't lie. <laughs> so honeybees do a set of dances in the beehive. Uh, particularly, they do a turn right, a waggle, and a turn left dance. And they do this in order to communicate the location of food sources to other bees in the hive. Um, so the, the scenario here is there's a camera that's monitoring this beehive, and then a computer vision tracker gives us these tracks of the honeybee. So in particular, our observation vector at time t is a vector of the xy body position, as well as the honeybee's head angle, which we decompose into sine and cosine. So let's just look at the, the data corresponding to a turn left dance. Well, a reasonable model here is to assume that our observation vector at time t is some linear function of the previous observation vector. However, this model is of course not perfect, so we can add some noise, and then we refer to this as a vector autoregressive process. So in this scenario, we're gonna assume that this dynamic matrix, this mapping, is unknown and we're gonna estimate it from data. So we look at this data from this turn left dance, we estimate this, um, this model, and then all of a sudden, the honeybee switches to a waggle dance. And this dynamic model that we've estimated so far, well, it's no longer good for describing the data from this waggle dance. So we could define a different dance, a different dynamic for this dance. And actually for this dance, a much better model is a second order autoregressive component. So you need this second order lag from the observation at time t minus two. Okay, well, in general, when we're looking at these honeybee dances, we just get these observations over time. We're not told what underlying dance the honeybee is doing. We're in this fully unsupervised setting. And so um, what we'd like to do is we'd like to come up with a good dynamic model to describe this data in the face of this uncertainty of the underlying dance. So a previous approach to looking at this data um, looked at a change point model where they're looking for changes in the observed dynamics. Um, so we start in some dance one, then we observe some change, we create a new dance two, another change, dance three, and so on. So each one of these dances is to a new state, and each one of this, these states has its own dynamic parameters. And because of this, we're not sharing information between repeated <coughs> behaviors. So when the honeybee does a waggle dance again, we're not harnessing that information, and the parameters associated with any one of these dances, they're just estimated from a small amount of data, and this tends to lead to poor predictive uh, performance. So instead, let's imagine that we can actually capture the set of repeated behaviors that are present in this data. If we can do this, this enables us to pool information across time, leading to better predictions and better segmentations of this data. So just to emphasize this, what I mean is when we're looking at the parameters associated with, for example, that red state there, we're pooling information across all instances of that red state. And so this idea of repeated behaviors, it's not unique just to honeybee dances. It appears in many, many, many data sets that we look at. For example, when we're talking about conference audio, maybe um, a person who's speaking speaks later in the recording as well. And likewise, when a person's doing an exercise routine, they might return to behaviors they've done. Think of somebody going through a yoga routine, lots of repetitions. And likewise, when we're analyzing stock data, a common model is to assume that there's different regimes of volatility that, the, that we're switching between. Okay, so let's think about a way to capture these types of pattern behaviors. And one classical approach to this is the hidden Markov model, or HMM. And the HMM assumes that there's an underlying discrete valued state sequence represented by the Z random variables there, which is modeled as Markov with respect to some collection of transition distributions, pi. So in the motion capture application, Maybe these states uh, correspond to a set of action labels, such as jumping jacks, squats, side twists, and so on. And the Markov assumption implies that the probability of being in any one of these states based on the entire history of states we've seen only depends on the previous state. And so what we're showing in this equation here is a, uh, the probability of transitioning from a blue to orange state. So that's captured by that transition distribution. Okay, well one can view a sample path of the state sequence as a walk through the following state versus time lattice. 
Let's imagine that at the first time step, we start in the second state, which might correspond to jumping jacks. And we have the following set of possible transitions, where the relative weights of these arrows captures the probability of making each of these transitions. And that's captured by that state's transition distribution, pi 2. So this gives the probability of going from jumping jacks to squats, jumping jacks, side twists, and all our different possible states. Then let's imagine that we persist in the same jumping jack state, so that the next time we have the same set of possible transitions. Then we transition to a squat state, have two possible transitions, and so on. Well, the state sequence isn't observable to us. It's latent, and we'd like to infer it from our observations. And the hidden Markov model assumes that our observations, they're independent condition on this underlying state sequence. So, um, for example, maybe each observation is a vector of body position and joint angles. Um, so this represents a rather simplistic observation model here, and instead, uh, we can also consider other observation models, such as switches between the types of autoregressive processes I described for the honeybee dances, and this is referred to as an autoregressive hidden Markov model. Okay, well, in everything I've described so far, I've assumed that we have some fixed number of k possible states. Well, this begs the question, how many states should we use? So if we're looking at this motion capture example, maybe we define a model with five possible states, but then all of a sudden we are watching and this guy starts doing these knee raises, and we didn't include that state in our model, so then we can add this knee raise state re-estimate everything, and we keep watching, and then all of a sudden he does the Macarena, then trends change, and all of a sudden he's doing Zumba, and recently we saw him doing a Gangnam Style dance, right? So <laughs> we, we keep observing this, and the question is, how many new dances can appear? How many new behaviors can appear um, as we're observing this process? How many states do we use in our model? Well, of course, in any finite like, time series, there can only be a finite number of states, but it would be nice if we could allow for an unbounded number of possible states and then encourage the use of a sparse subset, penalizing the addition of new states. Okay, so in such cases, an attractive approach is to appeal to Bayesian nonparametrics. And one method that, that's proven quite useful just in static clustering, so not dynamic data, um, is the Dirichlet process. So here we're showing um, observations, two-dimensional observations, generated from a mixture of Gaussians with an unknown number of mixture components, which in this case happen to be three. Well, the Dirichlet process allows you to infer that from the data while still allowing for new components to be added as more data are observed, this guy up here. Okay, and so the way the Dirichlet process does this is by introducing a countably infinite set of model parameters and then encouraging the use of a sparse subset of them. But if we get data, such as the, these purple observations up here that don't agree with the clusters we've seen so far, the model allows for a new component to be added to our mixture. Okay, so we can think of these clusters as representing all our observations of jumping tracks, squats, and side twists, and then we got this new data and saw this Gingham style dance. Um, but remember that we're looking at time series. So in that case, the, the structure, the order in which the observations are arriving matters. Um, so in what our interests are going to be in is defining a hidden Markov model with a countably infinite set of possible states. So in this case, we need to define transition distributions that are countably infinite. There's positive probability of going from any state to each one of these infinite set of possible states. And it's been shown that a hierarchical layering of Dirichlet processes is useful in doing this. In particular, the Dirichlet process is what allows for this unbounded state space, just as it allowed for an unbounded number of clusters in that static clustering application. And it's also the Dirichlet process that's going to encourage the use of a sparse subset. The hierarchical layering of these Dirichlet processes is needed in order to tie together the transition distributions to create a, sparse, uh, a shared sparse set of possible states visited. So we developed a generalization of this HDPHMM called the sticky HDPHMM that aims to better capture state persistence by increasing my cursor, the prior bias towards self-transitions. So if we're currently doing a jumping jack, we're more likely to continue doing a jumping jack than to switch to some new state. Um, and in particular, we're going to infer this prior bias towards self-transitions from the data. 
Okay, so I just want to emphasize that even though we're introducing this infinite set of possible states, we're only going to use a sparse subset of them, and it's only when we observe data that doesn't fit any of the dynamics we've seen so far that a new state's going to pop up. Okay, so um, to understand the difference between this original HTPHMM and our sticky variant, it's useful to just look at draws from this model. And so I'm, I'm showing state sequences drawn from these two different model variants. Um, and if these state sequences are going to represent, for example, labels of who's speaking when in a conference audio recording, or which action am I taking within an exercise routine, well, the dynamics of this sticky HTPHMM are much better capturing the types of dynamics we expect in real data than this very rapid switching between different states. Um, and we showed in a number of applications that it's very important to capture this in our model. So one application we looked at is that of speaker diarization, so the problem is segmenting conference audio into a set of speaker homogeneous regions in the presence of an unknown number of speakers. So in particular, we looked at the NIST speaker diarization, database. It has 21 recorded meetings with ground truth labels but we're just using those ground truth labels to assess our performance fully unsupervised. Um, and in particular, we're gonna look at the speaker diarization error rate. It's basically just a calculation of the percent of incorrect speaker uh, labels, so lower is better. Um, and we're gonna show that the sticky HTPHMM leads to state-of-the-art diarizations. So first, let's look at the Berkeley ICSI team's performance. So their approach, it's heavily engineered to this task. They actually have a floor of an office building dedicated to looking at these types of problems. Um, they use agglomerative clustering, start with a large number of estimated speakers, and then slowly merge speakers when certain criteria are met. Well, now let's look at the performance of their original HTPHMM. Much worse. So this is a case where there's no prior bias towards self-transitions. But if we look at the sticky HTPHMM, where in this case the prior bias towards self-transitions, or the bias is going to be learned from the data, we're not fixing it ahead of time, we see much better diarizations. And the point here isn't that we're beating this ICSI team, but just that we can provide comparable performance without building in all the application-specific information that that team used. Okay, well, in addition to speaker diarization we also showed that Markov switching processes based off of the sticky HTPHMM were useful in detecting changes of volatility in the stock index and segmenting these honeybee dances. And the cool thing here is that in both of these cases, the stock data and the honeybee dances, we used exactly the same model. But in one case, we passed daily returns of a stock index. In the other case, we passed these tracks of honeybees. And it inferred this underlying structure without being aware of what application it was looking at. OK, so now let's turn to this problem of looking at collections of related time series and how we share information between them, especially in the presence of limited data from each individually. And so the application that we're going to look at um, in this scenario is weekly crime counts from 2001 to 2008 taken from 188 different census tracts in D.C. And our inferences in particular, we're interested in predicting violent crimes. So we're limiting our analysis just to um, assault with deadly weapon, arson, robbery, and rape. So we would at least hope that the counts are pretty low. So for each one of these different tracks, we're going to get a time series of counts over the weeks. So this region happened to be pretty safe, very low counts. Most of the regions look more like this, counts on the order of 0 to 4, 4 being pretty rare. But occasionally, we see tracks with very high crime rates. Um, but again, these are still low numbers for a discrete time series setting. So in this map, I'm showing an intensity. It's an intensity map of the average weekly crime counts in each of these different locations. And our goal here is to forecast the next week's map of crime activity based on what we, we've observed so far. And a challenge here is the fact that we're dealing with this low count discrete data. So often with discrete data, people do these transformations and approximate the data as continuous, but those approximations are only valid when you have large counts. So we can't use those approximations here. Um, and so we're in this more challenging setup and we're going to need to somehow share information between related time series here. But one thing to note when we're thinking about how to share information is the fact that spatial proximity is really not the best measure of similarity between these different tracks. Um, and this makes sense if you think of how a census tract is defined, OK? So, because it's defined to be uh, demographically homogeneous. So a neighboring tract can be actually quite different. 
So we see similar behaviors between spatially disjoint tracks, whereas neighboring tracks can have very similar crime rates, uh, very different crime rates. Um, and so this is kind of a, you get this other side of the tracks effect. Um, and another thing is that there are physical barriers, like there's a river that runs through this area, which prevents the spread of crime across the river. So in this case, when we think about how we're gonna share information, we're just gonna cluster the locations that we observe similar dynamics. So our model for um, the data within any one location is gonna be a Poisson integer valued autoregression. And these models arise from the queuing theory literature, where there the observation is how many customers are in your queue at a given time, and it's modeled as some binomial thinning of the previous set of customers. So for every customer that was in the queue, you flip a coin and decide whether to serve them or whether they remain in the queue. And then there's some Poisson arrival of new customers, and they arrive with some rate lambda. But in our case, we're gonna add this index i, which corresponds to the tracked location, and yit is gonna represent the number of crimes in location i at time t. Okay, so here we're gonna cluster these different regions based on the rate of arriving customers. So in particular, maybe these regions use one rate, theta one, these use a different rate, theta two, and these regions might use theta three. And by clustering the time series spatially, we're pooling information within those clusters. Um, but again, because we don't know the structure of this clustering and how many clusters are present, we're gonna use a Dirichlet process prior. So just as in the beginning of the talk, we looked at ideas of clustering over time to share information in that way, now we're looking at spatial clustering to share information between related time series. Okay, so in this plot on the right-hand side, I'm showing our posterior mean intensity of crimes at any point in time. And on the left, that was the empirical mean I showed earlier, just estimated from the data. So you see very similar structure. But again, remember that these margins, just counting occurrences of things is not enough for when we're trying to make predictions. If we just cared about average intensities of crime, we could do estimates from the data. But in order to look at predictions, we'd actually like to harness this dynamic model as well as the clustering that we introduced. So in particular, when we're gonna look at our predictions, we're gonna look at the mean squared error of crime counts in each of these 188 different tracks. We're gonna look at 12 weeks at the beginning of 2008. And if we just use a simple Poisson model of arrivals of crimes, we have mean squared error just below one. If we use our Poisson integer valued autoregression but do a least squares estimation independently for each of the tracks, we get slightly better predictions. But by far the best predictions are using our Bayesian approach to inference in this Poisson integer valued autoregression and clustering and sharing information between these time series. Okay, well up to this point when we've thought about a collection of time series, every time series individually had pretty simple dynamics, just a Poisson autoregression. But what if we have a collection of time series that have the type of complex dynamics that we looked at at the beginning of the talk? So in particular, we started by looking at these Markov switching processes to describe these complicated time series, and then we looked at clustering related time series, but what we'd really like to do is more of this idea of a space-time clustering, where each time series individually has complex dynamics, but we are relating the dynamics present between these time series. So um, an application for this is looking at a collection of videos of people performing some set of exercise routines. So each one of these videos, if we look at the time series from um, these recordings, it's well modeled using a Markov switching process. But if we were to individually or independently model each one of these time series using the types of processes described earlier, we would define processes on completely disjoint state spaces. This guy would be switching between the red dances, that guy between the green states, and the other guy between the blue states. Okay, well, if we wanna jointly model them, one naive approach is just to assume that they're all realizations of the same underlying process. They're switching between the same set of dynamic behaviors. But what we'd really like to capture is the fact that there's some sharing of dynamic behaviors between them, but also some variability. For example, maybe in this movie, the person does side twist, but that motion doesn't appear in any of the other movies. 
Well, we're going to start by modeling each one of our time series using a switching autoregressive process, like I described before. And just to remember, this means that every state has conditionally autoregressive dynamics and is uniquely defined by some set of dynamic matrices and noise covariance. So again, we're going to introduce an infinite set of possible dynamic behaviors, such as jumping jacks, side twists, arm circles, and so on. And each one of these dynamic behaviors defines a different autoregressive dynamic. But here, not each of our time series is going to switch between the same set of behaviors. So we're going to think of these instead as features that are either selected or not. And we're going to summarize the set of selected features, the set of selected behaviors, with a feature matrix, where every row corresponds to a different one of our time series, so a different movie. And every column corresponds to a different dynamic behavior from our shared library. So our jumping jacks, side twists, arm circles, and so on. And the colored squares in this matrix indicate the set of selected behaviors. So each time series has a feature vector that's going to constrain that time series to only switch between its set of selected behaviors. And the way it's going to do this is by operating on a collection of transition distributions. So in particular, imagine that we define these transition distributions in this infinite dimensional space. And then we zero out any of the elements for which it um, did not select that behavior. So we do this element-wise product, renormalize. And now we see that this time series is restricted to only switching between its set of selected behaviors. OK, so then the key ingredient here is how are we going to define this feature matrix? And for this, an alternative Bayesian nonparametric method known as the beta process is quite useful. It allows us to define a process with infinitely many possible features. It encourages the use of a sparse subset. And in particular, it encourages this very flexible sharing pattern, where it encourages sharing of features between the time series, but also allows for some variability. Um, and so we're going to refer to that model as the BPARHMM for beta process autoregressive hidden Markov model. OK, so using that model, we analyzed a set of videos taken from the CMU mocap database. And so we looked at these six videos, and each of them, I think they're grad students dressed up in these motion capture suits that provide recordings of 62 dimensions of joint angle and body position measurements. Um, and we're just going to look at the 12 that correspond to gross motor movement. We don't care about things like what the digits are doing. But our goal here is to discover common behavior shared between these different time series. And from this plot, you can see that we've been able to do just that. So each one of these skeleton plots corresponds to a learned contiguous segment of at least two seconds of motion. And we're grouping together all of the segments that were labeled as having been generated from the same underlying dynamic behavior. And the color of the box indicates the true behavior category. So from this, we see that we've been able to identify these six examples of jumping jacks that, that appeared in these different movies, side twists, arm circles, and squats. And one nice thing about our formulation is the fact that we've been able to identify a set of behaviors that appeared in one and only one movie. We did, however, split a couple motion categories. But there's a reason for this if you look closely at the data. In one case, um, for this knee raise motion, the person is doing a counter motion for their arms with their knees. In the other case, the person has a lot of side to side upper body motion. And similarly, for the running motion, in one case, the person, I don't know why, they're running with their hands in sync with their knees. In the other case, they're doing a more natural running motion. And the other person on the end is in the middle of doing a jumping jack as he starts running. Just generally confused, but what you can see is that we've clearly been able to identify a set of behaviors that appeared in multiple time series while still allowing for a set of unique behaviors to pop up. OK, yeah. very robust bit? Yes, so there's a paper that we just have at NIPS this year that kind of explores a lot more in terms of this model and sensitivity. So I would say it's, it, it, from what we've seen, it really hasn't been sensitive to initially, or it's more in terms of computations. It was sensitive to initialization. But this, this latest, greatest way we have for doing computing, it really nicely, you can initialize everything to all be in the same dynamic behavior. And it goes through and it discovers it's things that look very similar to this without these clever initializations. So check out our new paper.
So we also used this BPA RHMM to look at the problem of parsing EEG recordings. And our goal here is both to standardize and automate this process of reading EEG, as well as to relate subclinical bursts of activity to full-blown clinical seizures. Um, so in particular, our data are going to come from intracranial EEG recordings, where we have these grid electrodes. And the collection of channels here represent the time series that we wish to jointly model. Um, and just remember that for the BPARHMM, once you condition on the model parameters, the time series evolved independently. One guy's exercise routine wasn't influencing that of the other guy. But here, that's clearly not the case. What we're showing in this plot are the residuals in channel voltages after subtracting BPARHMM predictions. And we see that there are clearly spatial correlations in these errors. So we'd like to capture this correlation structure while coping with the dimensionality of this time series. So what we're going to do is we're going to harness a graphical model with structure based on the spatial adjacencies of the channels in this grid electrode in order to couple these different time series. So we're introducing a sparse dependency structure between our time series. And in addition, another thing we'd like to capture is the fact that the correlations between the channels, so the parameters defined on this graph, change as the person's undergoing a seizure. So during the onset, offset, um, and also the resting state of the seizure, we have different types of correlations. So we're going to introduce an underlying covariance state. Um, so using this type of model, we can get parsings of intracranial EEG recordings that look like the following, where on the bottom, the grayscale bar ind indicates this underlying covariance state. So it indicates the correlations between the channels and how they're changing with time. And then on the top, we're showing our parsing of um, the intracranial EEG recordings into a set of different dynamic behaviors. So remember, we have a shared library of possible dynamics. And each of the different channels can choose its subset of dynamics and switch between them asynchronously. So using this type of parsing of EEG, we can look at this problem of relating subclinical bursts of activity to full-blown clinical seizures. Um, so in the last decade, there's been a lot of discoveries of other types of abnormal activity beyond full-blown seizures. Um, in particular, these subclinical bursts, they last fewer than 10 seconds, and they increase in frequency in the hours preceding a seizure. So there's a lot of interest in understanding both the similarities and differences between subclinical bursts and full-blown clinical seizures. So in the top two plots, I'm showing two subclinical bursts. And on the bottom plot, I'm showing the onset of a full-blown clinical seizure. But our analyses were actually done jointly on 14 subclinical bursts and one full clinical seizure, all taken from a single patient's recordings. And what our results indicate is that the onset dynamics are extremely similar between these different events. However, for the subclinical bursts, you get this disrupting discharge and the dynamic that appears there never appears in the full-blown seizure. And so this leads us to hypothesize that these subclinical bursts might be some type of false start seizure. The question is, what's the time scale for the subclinical burst? See paper for details. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have that information right now. So it's in seconds. It's in, yeah, this is on the order of seconds. So finally, let's look at this idea of having a single time series that's high dimensional with changing correlations between the dimensions of this time series. So this relates to some of the ideas that I discussed for the intracranial EEG, where you have those changing correlations. But just to make this a bit more concrete, let's look at a very simple and intuitive example of how height and weight vary as a function of age. So here, age is our predictor. Just think of it as a time index. And height and weight are going to correspond to the elements of our observation vector. And as we all know, the mean height and weight of the population increases with age. So you might be familiar with these types of charts from visits to your doctor's office. Um, so in, but in addition to the mean increasing, the variance also increases with age. However, what these charts fail to capture is how height and weight co-vary, because they simply capture the marginal distributions. So instead, let's imagine that we actually have the joint distribution of height and weight at three different points in our predictor space, age 5, age 15, and age 25. Well, maybe it makes sense that when we're very young, height and weight are highly correlated. So that's indicated by these ellipses here, where it's saying that if weight is in this region, height is likely to be in this region. 
Um, but maybe with, as the age increases, the correlation decreases. So you tell me somebody who's 25 is overweight, that might not tell me all that much about their height. Okay, well, a lot of multivariate modeling has focused on capturing a changing mean with predictor, but assuming a static covariance, what's called a homoscedastic model. But instead, we'd like to actually capture these changing correlations. So we're interested in modeling heteroscedastic processes where we have a covariance matrix indexed by predictor, in our case, by time. So X, in our case, is gonna represent some continuous value time index, and sigma is this covariance matrix that captures the correlations between the different elements of our observation vector. So one application where these ideas of heteroscedasticity are really important is looking at MEG data. Um, so I won't go into the details of this re recording mechanism. Um, you can think of it kind of as a hybrid between EEG and fMRI. A person sits in this chair and wears this helmet that has 102 spatially distributed sensors that provide recordings of the magnetic field induced by the underlying neuronal activity. Um, and these recordings are often used for studies of human cognition. So for example, how does the brain encode different concepts? So in such a study, maybe a person shown a word like cow, and then we get recordings as the person's processing it. So we get this 102 dimensional time series at a very high temporal resolution. Then the person might be shown the word apple and get a different recording. And in order to understand how the brain's encoding concepts, it's important to model how um, this activity is changing over time as a function of the word stimulus. So clearly, this is an example of a high dimensional time series. Um, and in addition, there are time varying correlations between the different sensors that's induced by time varying changes in the uh, coactivation pattern of the brain. So this relates to ideas of functional connectivity within neuroscience. And let's just start by thinking of how we're gonna cope with the dimensionality of this time series. And one thing we observe is the fact that these spatially distributed sensors provide redundant recordings, in essence. And another thing, however, is the fact that there can be long-range correlations, for example, bilateral activation. And so based on this type of um, redundancy and correlation structure, it might be appropriate to assume that our covariance that describes these correlations has a low rank decomposition. So we have some rank K component with K being much, much less than P, and then this diagonal component. So in pictures, what we're saying is we're taking our full covariance matrix and assuming it decomposes as follows. So this represents a very different idea of sharing information than when I presented at the beginning of the talk. At the beginning of the talk, we were talking about clustering and pooling information in that way. But here we're thinking about sharing information by harnessing a lower dimensional embedding of our observations and sharing information in that subspace. Okay, but as I mentioned, there are changing correlations with time. So what we'd like to do is capture a covariance matrix that's indexed by time. Um, and the way we're gonna do this is by capturing time variation in the low rank component of this decomposition. So in pictures, this P by K lambda matrix is gonna be a matrix of some set of dictionary functions defined over time. And in our case, we're gonna take them to be Gaussian process random functions, so it's a flexible specification for this dictionary. And to build up our time varying covariance, we're gonna multiply this matrix times its transpose and add a diagonal component. So just to get a sense of what we can infer with these type of heteroscedastic models, um, we're gonna look at the changing correlations between this sensor and every other sensor um, in response to the word kick. So we, what we see is that as this person is semantically processing this word, different regions of the brain coactivate, and the, the pattern of this coactivation um, changes with time, and it's also different for different types of word stimuli. So now let's actually get to our inferential task, which is doing word classification from this MEG data. So in particular, we have four different categories, animals, food, tools, and buildings. In each one of these categories, we have five words. And for each one of these words, a person's shown that word 20 times. We get 20 trials. And we're gonna use 15 of those trials for training. And we're gonna hold out five to test our classification performance. 
And the goal here is just to classify the word into the correct word category. So chant should be 25%. Um, so this is just in the context of David Pogue, is that right or not? Yes, so okay. uh, this is, Tom Mitchell has had a line of work in terms of ideas of word classification using MEG data for understanding concepts. Um, the thing that is different about this, Tom Mitchell's a co-author, so it's part of this, this body of work, but we're trying to do single trial MEG classification. So from a single instance of showing a person a word and getting those recordings, that's, it's a very noisy thing. Typically they average over trials, but we're trying to just from a single shot classify that word. And so don't expect large numbers. The data is really noisy. It's a very hard task. Um, so what I'm showing in, in this plot is our classification performance for two different subjects. So two people sitting in this chair and going through this experiment. And in blue, I'm showing a model where we allow for just a time varying mean, maximum likelihood estimate, but a static covariance. And so in one case, we have performance that's just above chance. In the other case, it's actually below chance. Better off just flipping a coin. If we simply use the same model but allow for a time varying covariance using a kernel-based estimate, we get better performance. So clearly, before we even talk about our model, capturing heteroscedasticity is important. But the best performance is our method, which we show in yellow, um, which not only captures heteroscedasticity in this flexible way using these Bayesian, this these Bayesian nonparametrics, but also harnesses a lower dimensional subspace, a low rank approximation to that covariance process. Um, and the performance even exceeds that of a powerful discriminative based classifier, the SVM. Okay, so just to get a sense of why heteroscedasticity is so important, I'm gonna show some correlation plots. Um, in this case, for two different words, hammer and house. So hammer's one column, house is the other and for two different sensors, one in the occipital lobe, the top row, and one in the parietal lobe, the bottom row. And so it's a correlation between that sensor and every other sensor at a fixed point in time. And the first set of plots here shows a time point very early on in the time series, something within what's called the perceptual response. So before the person's understood the meaning of the word. Um, and what you see are very similar correlation plots, really little to distinguish between these two words. But if we look later in the time series, 401 milliseconds, you see very different correlation structure. For example, hammer, we have this, if I can find my mouse, bilateral activation pattern that you don't see for the word house. And it's hypothesized that this is related to motor cortex activation related to the tool word hammer, person just visualizing the tool word um, that you don't see for house. So that, that kind of differential structure is important in our word classification. Um, and it allows us to very efficiently share information in a way that changes as we walk through this time series. Okay, so I also wanted to describe our application of this type of covariance process to analyzing flu data. In particular, we looked at the Google flu trends data set. Um, so Google devised a model that's supposed to be predictive of flu rates just based on user search queries. Um, and in particular, we're gonna look at the data taken from September 2003 to October 2010. Um, and we're looking at the data from the US. So from Google's model, this results in 183 dimensional time series. They give an estimate for the US national level, 50 different states, 10 regions, and 122 cities. And we get 370 weeks of observations. Um, but there's lots of missing data. I mean, 370 observations when we're talking about 183 dimensions isn't many to begin with. Um, but let's just look at this missing data structure. And what I'm showing in this plot, the blue line corresponds to the total number of regions reporting, and the red line corresponds to the total number of possible, 183. And what we see is that by the end of the first year, fewer than 75% of the regions are reporting, and it takes until the end of the fourth year to get all the regions reporting. So lots of missing data. And both because of the, the, the dimensionality of this problem and this substantial missing data, it's very challenging to fully and directly analyze this data within existing methods. And I haven't discussed how in this talk, but the formulation that we have for the covariance process that has a few more spiffy things that I didn't get into allows us to cope with this type of missing data. In particular, we can make inferences just based on the data that's available um, without relying on imputing the missing values. 
So that's really important when you have lots of missing data. Okay, so here are just a few plots of our results. Again, we're looking at correlation maps where we're gonna look at four geographically distinct states, New York, California, Georgia, and South Dakota, at three different time points, one corresponding to a very mild flu season, one in an extremely bad flu season, and the other one during the swine flu epidemic. Um, note that we could make these maps for each of the 183 regions every time point, but this just shows the kind of structure that we uncover. Um, and in particular, we see that without providing geographic information to the data, we just provided this, this time series, we're able to uncover this unique geographic structure. And in addition, and really the, the key point here is the fact that we're able to capture changing correlations with time. So both the um, intensity and extent of these correlations changes with different flu seasons. So I just wanna conclude by showing a movie of our estimates of flu activity just for California and New York. Um, so what you see is that during flu events, you see much more similar correlation structures, but during non-flu events, you see much weaker correlations and also much more local geographic structure. So this just gives you a sense of what we're um, estimating as a function of time. And so just a few movies to end with. <laughs> um, so just to, to wrap up here, in this talk we looked at ideas of sharing information within time series. We looked at sharing across time using these ideas of Markov switching processes and across space where we were clustering different time series. And then we looked at this space-time clustering where again their space was just indexing which time series we were looking at um, using feature-based processes. And finally, we looked at ideas of how to scale to high dimensional time series and capture changing correlations in them. And for this, we looked at harnessing low rank approximations. And in all of these methods, we exploited Bayesian nonparametrics in order to develop very flexible sharing patterns and flexible dynamics in how these time series evolve. And we demonstrated the utility of these models on a number of challenging applications, including speaker diarization, Motion, motion capture analysis, crime data, EEG, MEG, flu trends, and a few others. So, thank you. Questions? So, in the last project, I'm just curious why not inverse computer Because it shows, you, shows us the condition independence. Um, the question was, why are we not looking at inverse covariances? Um, why are we looking at the covariance matrix itself? And that's a very good question. And it's really two different ideas. So in one of the processes, when I talked about graphical models, that was ideas of inverse covariance. So, if it, so for those who aren't familiar, when you talk about sparsity in your inverse covariance, zeros, that, that means conditional independencies between the time series. And then the covariance captures correlations. And so it depends on the application, which is the appropriate thing to do. If you believe that there are actually conditional independencies between your time series, which from those intracranial EEG recordings, these grid electrodes, they're very close together. There's very, um, the, the actual structure of that, it does lead to the sparse dependency structure. But for the MEG application, unless you happen to tell it ahead of time, like these two things are co-activating and then that structure changes, you, you'd really wanna capture a graph, you'd have to learn a graphical model that had potentially long range correlations and then it would change. So it's just a different idea of, uh, in essence, low rank or, or a lower dimensional description of the time series. Um, and so in the flu data and the MEG, you don't get a, a sparse graphical model structure. It's really redundancies between the observations that could be long range. So, sorry, I just want to harp on this. You should take the big data class in the winter. We're gonna go through ideas of, of these different models, but um, the, the key thing is the fact that a lot of spatial processes, they use some neighborhood structure, but what you saw in this flu data is very geographically distinct or spatially distinct states like California and New York had very strong correlations. And a lot of um, Markov random field approaches, they don't capture these ideas when they just build in or at least not directly, when they just build a neighborhood structure. So low rank is good, and it's really nice to deal with. It's really easy, so that was a very long response to.
quick question, but it's a very important question. One question is, can you build in covariates? And the other question is seasonality. Well, and they're related, <laughs> but yes and yes, we, we do both of those things. Um, so in the clustering, you, you can use a linear model that has covariates built in, and we actually showed that it gets into some subtle details. I'll just say, yes, you can do it, but because these census tracts are pretty demographically hom homogenous, it didn't really matter all that much, um, but it is possible. In, in that type of model, you can build in a linear model for, for the rates for the clustering. And then the other thing is seasonality, and we absolutely built in seasonality, so the rate, regardless of what cluster you're in, had a common seasonal component, because you see crimes increasing in warmer months and decreasing outside of that. There's a, a strong seasonality, so we did account for that. Yeah. Okay. Do you see if, say, a new railroad is built, will you account for that, or will it just kind of throw off results for those uh, uh, demographic regions? So I guess, like I mean. You build a new railroad, and all of a sudden, you get this. The, the clustering changes, right? Um, so. This kind of gets into a practical question of like how you're doing your inferences. Like, are you doing it in batch and then assuming that model indefinitely, or are you recomputing things as you're getting data? Which um, here we're looking just at a batch of data, um, but there are ways of thinking about doing online inferences. Again, we'll go through that in the big data class. Um, but in two, if let's say you just got another chunk of data, if as you're going through the sampling, because you're using this Dirichlet process on the clustering. It's not fixing the number of clusters you get or the structure, so it can, it can get a, a new kind of assignment once you observe that. Emily, thank you very much. Thank you.